Hi folks, good to be with you. Love to everybody out there. Uh, thanks for all your support. Uh, don't forget my website, jasonbirdspreacher.com. You can get me on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, it's good to be with you all. Pray about me going to Ghana. I value your prayers. Thank you for all your prayers concerning uh, Hyde Park. We need your prayers. Um, we probably, if someone got in touch with me today, they uh, offered to help. So it seems like... Uh, I've been encouraged, so I, 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 the going to Hyde Park will probably be on in November sometime. I'll give more details in a, in a few days' time. But anyhow, I want to just look about the Trinity. So we're going to pray, and uh, we're going to look at some literature on the Trinity. So I hope it's a blessing to you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. And Lord Jesus, in your name, we pray that you might be pleased to bless uh, this study may edify people and encourage people in Jesus name Amen Amen so we're going to look at the Trinity from these theologians uh, Lewis Burkhoff Systematic Theology you can get it from the Banner of Truth um, so that's Lewis Burkhoff Systematic Theology Banner of Truth and then the Doctrine of God by Herman Bavink, a Dutch theologian. At the back, there's a picture of Herman Bavink. So, without further ado, we're going to just read what they say. We won't be able to get through all of Bavink, but we'll get through all of um, we'll get through all of Burkhoff. Burkhoff writes on page 82. The doctrine of the Trinity has always bristled with difficulties and therefore it is no wonder the Church, in its attempt to formulate, was repeatedly tempted to rationalise it and give it a construction of it which failed to do justice to the scriptural data. Number one, the pre-Reformation period. The Jews of Jesus' day strongly emphasised the unity of God and this emphasis was carried over into the Christian Church. The result was that some ruled out the personal distinctions in the Godhead altogether and that others failed to do full justice to the essential deity of the second persons of the Holy Trinity. Tertullian was the first to use the term Trinity and to formulate the doctrine, but his formulation was deficient since it involved an unwarranted subordination of the Son to the Father. Origen went even further in this direction by teaching explicitly the Son is subordinate to Father in respect to essence, and that the Holy Spirit is subordinate even to the Son. He detracted from the essential deity of these two persons in the Godhead and furnished a stepping stone to the Iranians who denied the deity of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, right, by representing the Son as the first creature of the Father and the Holy Spirit as the first creature of the Son. Thus, substantia substantiality of the Son and the Holy Spirit with the Father was sacrificed in order to preserve the unity of the Godhead. The three persons of the Godhead were made to differ in rank. The Arians still retained a semblance of the doctrine of three persons in the Godhead, but this was sacrificed entirely to monarchianism, partly in the interest of the unity of God, and partly to maintain the deity of the Son. Dynamic monarchism saw in Jesus but a man, and in the Holy Spirit a divine influence, while modalistic monarchianism regarded the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit merely three modes of manifest successfully assumed by the Godhead. On the other hand, there were also some who lost sight of the unity of Godhead to such an extent that they landed into tritheism. Some of the later monotheosites and such as John Ascunges and John uh, Philoponos fell into error. During the Middle, Age, Middle Ages, the nominalist, the Rossilians, was accused of the same error. The Church began to formulate its doctrine of the Trinity in the 4th century. The Council of Nicaea declared the Son to be called essential with the Father, 325 AD, while the Council of Constantinople, 381, asserted the deity of the Holy Spirit, though not with the same precision. As the interrelation of the three, it was officially professed that the Son is generated by the Father, and that the Holy Spirit precedes the Father and the Son, 
in the East, the doctrine of the, of the Trinity, found its fullest statement in the work of John Damascus and in the West in Augustine's work De Trinidate. The former still retains an element of subordination which is entirely eliminated by the later. Any thoughts there? Mm. I think um, um, if you look at the size of the book uh, it's quite a large book, but when, you, when you're thinking about the period of the Church of History that Burkhoff is mentioning, uh, you could write ten volumes alone just on origin, let alone Tertullian, let alone Irenaeus. So what I'm saying is, I take what Burkhoff is saying, even though I respect him greatly, uh, there's a lot of information there that he's covering that would require a lot of books and quotes to, to, to substantiate. So the point that I'm getting at is one has to go and do your own research as well. You've got to go and read these writers as well. Don't just take a theologian's word for it. Uh, because he's mentioning quite a lot of theological information from origin to the monarchist to Tertullian, etc., to the Arian. So, uh, he's used one page that would take quite a lot of volumes to expound in, in, in detail. So, so, basically my advice is when you're studying theology books, sorry about the, my phone, when you're studying theology books, make sure that you go beyond what they say and do your own research. Um, so then he goes, number two, the post-reformation period. We have no further development in the doctrine, doctrine of the Trinity, but only encounter repeatedly some of the earlier erroneous constructions of it after the Reformation. The Arminians, the Episcopalians, the Corsilians and Limboro revived the doctrine of subordination, chiefly again so it seems to maintain the unity of the Godhead. He ascribed the Father a certain preeminence over other persons in order, dignity and power. A somewhat similar position was taken by Samuel Clark in England by the Lutheran theologian Canis. Now, I have to take my glasses off here because... So he talks about the pre-Reformation period then he's on about, sorry, the post-Reformation period. And he makes a jump from Origen and Tertullian to Lutheran theologians. This is not really a proper in-depth study of the Trinity from an early church perspective because you can't talk about the Trinity without talking about the Cappadocian Fathers. And you can't really talk about the Trinity unless you go into detail of what Tertullian actually said specifically. So there's massive big chunks of church history being missed out here, although I do respect Lewis Burkhoff. Others followed the way pointed out by Sibelius by teaching a special modalism, as for instance Emmanuel Swinburne, who held that the eternal God had became flesh in the Son and operated through the Holy Spirit. Hegel, who speaks of the Father as God in himself, of the Son as God objectifying himself, and the Holy Spirit as God returning unto himself. The Schleimacher, who regards the three persons simply as three aspects of God, the Father is God, the underlying unity of things, the Son is God as coming to consciousness, personality, and man, and the Holy Spirit is God as living in church, in the church. Yeah, so Hegel, uh, a philosopher uh, quoted his understanding of the Trinity with philosophy and Schleimacher believed that you prove God by our consciousness that our consciousness depends upon God so this was the foundation of the theology the Sicinians uh, of the days of the rationalist sorry the Sicinians of the days of the Reformation moved along Arian lines, 
but even went beyond Arius by making Christ merely a man and the Holy Spirit but a power or influence. They were the forerunners of the Unitarians and also the liberal theologians who speak of Jesus as a divine teacher and identify the Holy Spirit with the, with the imminent God. Finally, there were also some who, since they regarded the statement of the doctrine of Trinity and ontological Trinity as unintelligible, wanted to stop short of it and rest satisfied with the doctrine of an economic Trinity, a Trinity as revealed in the work of redemption and in human experience as Moses Stewart, W. Alexander and W. A. Brown. For a considerable time the interest of the doctrine of the Trinity waned and theological dis discussion centred more particularly on the personality of God. Brunet and Barth have again called attention to its importance. The later places it very much in the foreground discussing it in connection with the doctrine of Revelation and devotes 220 pages of his dogmatics to it. Materially he derives the doctrine from scripture but formally and logically he finds that it is involved in the simple sentence God speaks. He is revealer, father, revelation, son, revealedness, revealedness, Holy Spirit. He reveals himself, he is the revelation, he is also the content of revelation. God and his revelation are identified. He remains God also in his revelation, absolutely free and sovereign. This view of Bath is not a species is not a species of Sabellianism, for he recognizes three persons in the Godhead. Moreover, he does not allow for any subordinationism. Says he thus, to the same God who is an impaired unity to reveal a revelation and revealedness is also ascribed in unimpaired variety in himself precisely this threefold mode of being. Um, just a little note that those who reduce the Trinity uh, and strip the Godhead to just being God and getting rid of the persons like the Unitarians and the Sicinians uh, basically a rationalist because if you were a rationalist you'll strip away what the divine text says and you'll try to understand things from a rationalistic perspective now when Birkhoff mentioned Brunner and Barth Barth was also a rationalist he, he used existential philosophy so I would say to theology students when you're studying Barth you have to take him with a pinch of salt because behind his theological reflection, which Birkhoff doesn't pick up on here, is he's using theological language, but it's philosophy behind his, his um, theological pontifications. So it's language, religious language, but behind it is philosophy. So now we'll take a, a break from there and we'll go on to the next part so that's kind of like a brief history of the Trinity okay uh, it didn't tackle all the main players for example didn't look at uh, the Cappadocian Fathers and there was a heck of a lot more that that uh, Lewis Burkhoff could have mentioned but you only get you can only get so much in a systematic theology book so, so yeah, so we'll go to the next, the next part.